There's never a good uh, moment or occasion or place in a worship service like this to uh, share some bad news with you. It doesn't concern our church, but it does concern our community. Uh, doubtless many of you have already heard uh, last night HB1 uh, helicopter from the Huntington Beach Police Department uh, crashed in Newport Bay. And uh, we now know that one of the officers on board, Nicholas Vela, lost his life last night. Um, I'm told that his, uh, the second chair, the, the, the second person on board the aircraft, uh, I was just told after the service was in bad condition last night, but I'm told, haven't confirmed, that he did leave the hospital earlier this morning. So we're grateful for that, but we're we're shaken. We have people both in Huntington Beach Fire and Huntington Beach Police Department that are members of this congregation. And this church loves anyone who runs toward trouble to help others. And that's what those officers were doing. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a random patrol flight. They were actually responding to a call for service uh, when that tragedy occurred. So as you make away, uh, your way around the city, Bear in mind, this is a very difficult time, particularly for the police department, for also but all, for all first responders in this community. And let's keep Officer Vela and his, uh, let's keep his family in prayer. Will you pray with me now? Father, I'm so grateful that you understand our needs. You are never taken by surprise. I'm grateful for the, for the witness in John chapter 11 that when Jesus was at the tomb of Lazarus, he wept. And Paul tells us that we don't know how to pray as we should, but the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So, Lord, we pray for the Vela family in particular. Didn't have the honor of knowing them, but I know they're heartbroken. I pray that you would send loving, understanding, compassionate people around them. People who would be able to speak to them of your grace and your hope. I pray for the other officer, Lord, that was injured and for all who responded. Uh, Lord, help us measure and treasure our days so that we will live them well. Reminding ourselves always, Lord, that there is no secure home here. Our home is in heaven. Thank you for, Lord, hearing the cries of the brokenhearted. I pray that the grace of Jesus and the good news of his triumph over death would reach many people and comfort many at this difficult time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll open your Bibles with me in 1 Peter chapter 1, we've been traveling along with Peter in his first letter to Gentiles scattered across the Roman Empire. The setting, if you haven't been with us, is one of the first and closest disciples of Jesus, now in the full maturity of his ministry some 30 years after the resurrection, is writing to people who are paying a price for being Christians. The full furnace of Roman persecution has not yet been ignited, but they're paying a price. Socially, relationally, economically, the people receiving this letter have actually suffered for Jesus, and Peter writes to comfort them. It's a surprising letter, and as I read the first paragraph again to you that we've been exploring for the last few weeks, you might again notice how dense the language is for someone who wrote as a commercial fisherman in Greek in the first century. The entire letter is intended to encourage them in suffering and to remind them how to behave while they suffer. It's particularly a call to suffer as Christians. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, 
Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Here's today's passage. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. And all God's people said, or maybe, wow, that's a lot. One big, long thought in Greek. What's happening here? Why is a commercial fisherman... Not an illiterate man, but why? But an, a simple man, and by the religious standards of his day, an uneducated man, why is he going on in such length, in such depth, that you might have lost yourself in the reading a little bit? I have as I've studied it. I've had to go back and reread a verse and make sure I know who he's talking about and what he's actually saying. There's a lot here, and you may notice in verse 3, this is all an expression of blessing, of praise to God. He's going to talk to them about their suffering. They're hurting. He knows it. That's why he's writing. He's on his way to talk to them about how much they're suffering, what it means, what to make of it, how to behave under it. But for now, what Peter has been doing is encouraging them by praising God. Let me walk you through this, what we've seen so far. First of all, he's told us, Peter has told us that our future salvation is certain. In verse 5, he says that they are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In other words, you're already saved, you're already loved, you've already been swept by God's love into his family, but your salvation is not yet complete. But it is so certain that God is protecting you, God is guarding you, God is watching over the inheritance and the treasure he has for you. Your salvation is certain. Then he talks about the trouble they're in right now, verse 7. He tells them their present suffering serves a purpose. Look in verse 7. The tested genuineness of your faith. In other words, you trust God. And the reason we know it is your faith has been tested. It's been proven. It's been put in the crucible and found to be true. The tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than the gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, your future is secure and the suffering you have in this world right now is purposeful. That's such an important foundation to put below your feet as you continue to walk through this hard world. So much suffering seems from our perspective can only be classified as chaotic as random, as unnecessary, unwarranted, inexplicable. Peter doesn't get into, and I'm not sure that the Bible itself tells us in any respect, including in the book of Job, which looks long and hard at the suffering of a godly man for reasons he does not understand. We are not assured in any sense that we will ever understand our suffering on this side of glory, but we are told that it is purposeful. That the testing of our faith, like fire, testing, melting, and refining gold, will eventually result in God praising, honoring us when we are 
fully saved at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whatever you're going through, you may not understand the purpose. One of the hardest questions I face as a pastor and the one I most often cannot begin to answer is, why is this happening? I can't be sure. In fact, it's only religion that tries to make a mechanistic view of why certain things happen and other things do not. But please understand, a God who's in charge of everything is never out of control, is never surprised by a difficult phone call, never looks down from heaven and says, oh no, what will I do now? You're aware of that, right? God doesn't work on contingency plans. We do. At least responsible people do. We have spare tires and we buy insurance and we try to have a little extra money and we try to take food, water, money, whatever we need when we're going to travel. We try to anticipate what could go wrong and be ready for it. God needs to make no provisions based on what happens. He's in charge of everything. And Peter would tell these suffering Christians, your future is secure and whether I can explain it or you can understand it, the suffering that you're enduring serves a purpose in God's plan. And now Peter's going to look at the past to explain how great their salvation is. Verse 10, Peter says, concerning this salvation. He's mentioned to them once and again their salvation, and now he says, I've told you about your future. It's secure. It's locked up. They're in no danger of losing your salvation. God is watching over you and guarding the fullness of your inheritance until he gets you safely home. The suffering that you're undergoing now does not change that for a moment. In fact, it's purposeful. It will refine and prove your faith, which will result in praise from God and a greater reward than you would have otherwise had had you not gone through the crucible. And now, if you notice, he's working his way back in history. He's spoken to them about the safety of their future. He's told them that even in suffering, the present has a purpose. Now he's going to look back 700 and a thousand years earlier to speak to them about the prophets and the point is to tell them how great their salvation actually is and this part at least whether we know much about god's grace and glory and salvation when it comes down to understanding what great is and what greatness is every american can relate to that because we love things when they're great in all respects People always want to know who the best is. What the best product, who the best person. You ever notice about doctors, everybody's doctor is the best? (laughs) Almost every person I've ever talked to has had surgery. They say he's the best. Somebody's got to graduate at the bottom of medical school, but, but, (laughs) but perhaps you're right. And you found, I'd never take their comfort away and say, how would you even know such a thing? Everybody wants to know the best. Everybody enjoys the best. He never understood it, and I've lost touch with him, but for years I worked with the pastor when we were both pastor cubs. He loved football, and he loved to talk about who the greats of the past were. He loved an old-school linebacker whose name has disappeared from history for a lot of people named Dick Butkus. And any time the name of that Chicago Bear monster was mentioned, I would say he's overrated. And he would just, my friend would just be enraged and call me things that no Christian should call any other Christian, much less pastor to pastor, tell me I was unintelligent and and worse, all because he never understood I was just winding him up. (laughs) Now, why do guys argue about LeBron versus Jordan? Don't get that started. Please don't have a side conversation. That's an ongoing debate of who the greatest basketball player might be. Of course, here many would make a case for Kobe. Again, don't get it started. My point is, we have, we are tuned, being made by God and being made in the image of God, we're hungry for greatness. God is great. He made us to respond to greatness. That's why we pay, some people pay tens of thousands of dollars to be, not at the pretty good bowl, what do we call it? The Super Bowl. We want to see the best in the world at the top of their game. We want to be seen at the best possible game. Nobody's particularly excited to go to the fourth grade basketball game. You're there because you love the kids playing the game. People say to their children, you did great, honey. No, not really. 
He's only nine years old. He double dribbled half the time. Great relative to all the other nine-year-olds, okay, but there's no greatness out there, at least not yet. Why am I telling you all this? Because Peter has been talking to suffering people about something that at first glance doesn't seem to matter. He's talking to them about something that they've experienced in their practical lives, that they have been saved and forgiven by Jesus. But he says, the fullness of your salvation hasn't even been revealed. It's still coming. Your future's secure. Your present, even in suffering, is very purposeful. But now he's going to do something surprising. He's going to dial the clock all the way back to up to a thousand years earlier and look at the past so that they will know how great this salvation is. And if you get the point of this message, you're going to leave church understanding this little paragraph and have a newer, deeper, better, stronger appreciation of how saved you really are, of how great God has been in saving you, of how great your salvation actually is. Verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophet's who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It's a pretty dense sentence for a commercial fisherman in the first century, don't you think? Let me walk you through it. Peter is saying, let me tell you more about your salvation. There were prophets who prophesied. Does that seem like bad writing to you, prophets who prophesied? I had, an, I had a Spanish teacher. I grew up in Mexico, so I didn't have many English teachers. But I had a Spanish teacher who would have absolutely marked me down for writing the prophets who prophesied. She said, that's bad writing. That is redundant. You think bad, God's a bad writer? Think the commercial fisherman missed a beat? No, it's very purposeful. It's in the Greek language that Peter was writing in. Some of your Bible translations have smoothed that out, and it doesn't quite say that because they're trying to make the English more palatable. This is a pretty literal translation that I'm reading to you, and Peter actually wrote something very similar to the prophets who prophesied. What's the point? He is talking about people who heard from God and spoke to God what they heard. That's what a prophet does. He speaks forth the word of God, and specifically, if you notice, in verse 11, he uses the word predicted. In other words, these prophets were not only explaining what God had already said, they were looking forward across history, explaining what God had promised and what God was about to do. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours... In other words, prophets, men sent from God and carried along by God's Spirit, spoke of a gift that you were going to receive. And when they heard about it, I'm still in verse 10, they responded to God's message. They searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when He, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but, what's it say? But you. Your salvation is so great that prophets wrote down your salvation as predictive prophecy for our sake. I'm fascinated by verse 10. It tells me that the prophets, when they received the word of God, were not in a trance-like state. There's a thing in occultism, witchcraft, called automatic writing, where someone is overcome and writes things down, not knowing what they're saying, not knowing what they're doing or what they're writing. That is not at all the picture of inspiration of the word of God being delivered. 
No, these were people who knew God, who sought after God, that even as God explained to them and, and gave them revelation, God explained himself and his plans to them. What they were doing was searching and inquiring carefully. They were asking God, verse 11, what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he, the Holy Spirit, predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. In other words, the prophets are in relationship with God, and even as God is speaking to them, they want to know more about it. They're asking him questions. I take it from this verse and others, I won't take the time to show you that the prophets wrote even more than they knew. They themselves could not begin to fully understand the magnitude of what God was revealing to them. That's why they were asking. That's why they were studying. That's why they were inquiring. And verse 10 says they were searching. Where are these prophecies? All through your Bible, just to the left. You can read prophets like Micah. You can read prophets like Isaiah. You can read King David in Psalm 22, give a detailed description of the physical agony of the crucifixion long before it was invented. You can read in Isaiah 53, 700 years before the birth of Jesus, the precise details of Jesus' death, even his burial. You can read elsewhere in a prophet the price that Judas gave when he betrayed Jesus, what the cost of the blood of Jesus meant to the traitor Judas. There's details all through it. And it was written ahead of time. And the point is, God has given you, in writing, a description of his own son and a description of his own plans. And Peter says, this was all done not for the prophet's sake. It wasn't for their enjoyment. It was for you. It was so that you could open your Bible and take comfort that God really is in charge of human history. And God himself has told you in advance what he's going to do, and he's put it in writing. Every once in a while, I see less and less of this, and I'm grateful for it, but every once in a while, the tabloids will have some hokey prophet whose prophecies are always so vague that it could be any number of things. It could be some worldwide war-like event or the Dallas Cowboys winning a playoff game for a change. It's so vague, nobody knows what's happening. Not the Word of God. It's clear, it's explicit, it's in writing hundreds of, hundreds of years ago, 3, 000, up to 3,000 years before the birth of Jesus, and we are blessed to be able to open God's word and to see prophecy not in the future, but to see prophecy already fulfilled in our own day on this side of the cross. Jesus knew what a blessing this was to disciples. Matthew 13, verses 16 and 17. Would you read this with me, please? Here's what Jesus said to people who saw him in person. Read this with me. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. It all happened. It happened on earth. You can visit the places where Jesus walked. You can visit the Sea of Galilee where Jesus showed the command of God over the storm. And all of those things were predicted for our sake. But notice something important in verse 11. Peter's going to begin to prepare them to understand and accept and bear up under their suffering like Christians. Verse 11 says, the Spirit of Christ predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent, what's it say? Glories. What came first for Jesus? From the verse we just read, what came first? Suffering. Then came? That's a very important thing to remember. For the Savior first came suffering, then came glory. And what is true for Jesus is true for we who are his disciples. There's always suffering on this side. First comes suffering, then comes glory. We won't do better than Jesus. Please understand that the disciples will not exceed the Master. 
If he suffered in obedience to the Father, so will we. It is false religion that teaches you that if you do things right, spiritually, materially, on this earth, you can be exempt from suffering altogether. It's not true. In fact, if your faith seeks only glory and never the cross, it's not Christian. The Christian message has been sanitized, edited, changed, packaged, and marketed to invite people to live the best possible of all lives right here, right now. That idea is simply not found in Scripture. What is true of Jesus will be true for his disciples. First we suffer, then comes glory. If you put all your hopes, if you put your dreams right here, right now, you'll be chronically disappointed because Jesus himself did not receive that. Verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. Now he's going to change the topic. Look, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Peter's looking at the past. He's still looking at the past, but now it's not the distant past. It's the very near past. Peter now is speaking not of prophets, but of preachers. His point is, you now enjoy a great salvation that was put down in writing for you centuries before you were born. God in His grace to encourage you and to show you His love, His faithfulness, His goodness, His greatness, wrote down His exact plan. The Holy Spirit carried men along and predicted in advance how Christ would suffer, and He put that in writing, not for the prophet's sake, but for yours. But then He says in verse 12, in the present day, you came to believe in Jesus because someone announced those things to you. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now, in your lifetime, been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Notice the Holy Spirit's doing all of this. It is the Spirit of Christ, another name for the Holy Spirit, that is moving in the prophets, and it was the Holy Spirit that sent ordinary Christians into the lives of Gentile believers in the first century to make them hear the good news of Jesus. The greatness of our salvation is not only seen in prophets, it's also seen in preachers, and we, like the people who read this letter for the first time, we believe the good news because someone announced it to us. Do you remember who that was for you? Do you remember how many times it took? Many years ago, when I was in seminary, one of our faculty members did a study that showed that way back then in the 90s, it took the average American six times of hearing the gospel before he believed. I don't, haven't found a similar study since, but I got to believe it's got to be twice that now. People are harder to believe, if harder to believe, harder to trust. They have less ready trust in God, I think, now than they did in the 90s when he did that study. But it is the Holy Spirit who's doing all of it. It's the Holy Spirit who moved in the prophets. It was the Holy Spirit who sent ordinary Christians into the lives of these people who are now suffering for Jesus. Peter is reminding them, God had you in mind all along. The prophets wrote things down about Jesus for your sake, and then the Holy Spirit, hundreds and hundreds of years later, in your own lifetime, sent preachers to, verse 12, preach the good news to you. That's how the gospel spread in the Roman Empire. That's why these people are now scattered. Look in Acts 9.31, just two quick snapshots of how the gospel spread from Jerusalem all the way through the Roman Empire. Read this with me, Acts 9.31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied much farther along in the Roman Empire, Acts 16, verse 5 says this. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, in the faith, and they increased in numbers, what? Daily. Has it ever occurred to you that the good news came to you on its way to someone else? That's the point of the gospel. Not that you would welcome it and keep it. No, the good news came to you on its way to someone else. You were never intended to be a reservoir. You weren't intended to keep it. 
The good news was intended to flow from God the Father, God the Son, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, through their lives onto your life, on its way to someone else. Do you remember who those people were? Could I just invite you, if you're keeping notes still, to write down the people who shared the gospel with you? Who was that for you? Who gave you the good news of Jesus? Who took a little courage, took a little time, showed a lot of love to tell you about Jesus? And a second question, harder question, who needs to hear the good news from you? What if in the spirit of the first church, in these early ancient churches that we read about in the book of Acts, where people are just going about their lives and continually telling people about Jesus, what if we left our homes and went to our offices, went out every, into our everyday lives, knowing that we had already been saved by the greatest person alive, that our salvation was so great that it had to be written down, that it had to be announced by people moved into our lives by the Holy Spirit? What if we took our daily routine as an adventure with God, an invitation from Jesus to see who we might be able to tell the good news to? It might completely transform your life to see you not only as a person who has been saved and set aside until someday you make it to heaven, but as someone who's been saved by the good news that was prophesied to you who can now, with all your flaws and with all your fears, say, look, I'm a hot mess, but I know Jesus, and he did something amazing for me. And tell them what he did. Do you remember your BC story? Your before Christ story? Remember who you were? Remember what you were doing? Remember what it was like? Or maybe you're like me and you had loving parents who shared the good news with you when you were a child and your story is not the great change that was wrought in your life because you were just a kid, but now as a grown man, I have perspective on all the things that God kept me out of. That's my story. That my story goes back generations and I don't have a dramatic before and after story because my grandfathers do. And that's the good news I could share, that Jesus can come into a family and into an individual's life or a family history and all together change it. But it gets even better, and the most amazing part of this passage is right at the end. Verse 12 again, it was revealed to them, to the prophets, that they were serving not themselves, but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And then this fascinating little phrase. Things into which angels long to look. There's not just prophets. There's not just preachers. There's also angels. Angels long to know more about how God saves us. Look at that phrase. Verse 12 says at the end, regarding our salvation, regarding these prophets, regarding these ordinary people sent into others' lives to tell them about Jesus, angels long to look into these things. The things I'm telling you about, holy angels in the presence of God want to know more about it. That is stunning. It tells me that angels want to study what Christians often take for granted. I won't walk you through everything that the New Testament says about this, which isn't much in the first place, but it seems that the display of God who knows everything and made everything concerning himself at such great cost to save ordinary people like us fascinates the holy angels who were created to serve him and be always in his presence. I can only think of one, one specific experience. Peter clumsily tries to defend Jesus and keep him from the crucifixion. And Jesus corrects him by telling Peter that he has many thousands of angels at his disposal who could come and rescue him at the Lord's command. Now, if I think about what that means, that means the Son of God dying on the cross, willingly, not as a victim, but as someone who has voluntarily entered into my place and yours to take my sins upon him, he has been sent there by his Father, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Trinity is united in its operations and united in its deeds. All of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has planned and purposed this moment. 
and now the son is dying and the father is receiving that sacrifice as full satisfaction for the sins of all mankind, and angels stand at the gate of heaven ready to make it stop. It won't, and it can't, because it is God's own will, but if I take Jesus at his word, it could have stopped at a moment. If Jesus said enough, it would be over. And now, angels who are not the point of salvation, who are not welcomed into God's family, who were made by God, greater, higher, holier than we, but not part of his redemptive plan, not welcomed as his own children. Look at the spectacle of people like us being saved by God, and they must marvel at it because verse 12 says, things into which angels long to look. The point of all this is that whether Peter is telling you about the security of your future or the purpose for suffering in your present or he's telling you the past to show you how much God has written and done so that you will know that you're saved, the point is that you will know the greatness of your salvation and we can suffer faithfully right now because our salvation was secured so very long ago. You and I can and should live with confidence on this side of the cross. Whatever's happening here, however broken our heart is, however many tears are torn out of us by suffering, we should be able to look back at the past and to the security of our future and understand that this present suffering doesn't change anything. That the past has already been decided, the future has already been secured. We can live faithfully, we can suffer as Christians right now because God in his greatness and goodness has done so much for us to be totally, utterly, beautifully, completely saved.